Welcome to Faith Talks, a monthly program on the The Generation podcast designed to help young ladies discover greater ways to nurture and exercise their faith in their day-to-day walk with Christ. Hello, this is Anna Faith, and welcome to Faith Talks. We are excited to continue on our theme of knowing the trying of your faith, that it works patience. And we are excited today to have a special guest. We have with us Mrs. Joyce Landis, and she work, She and her husband work with a special ministry, which she will tell us about. Um, but it is a special privilege to have her here. They come every year just recruiting at our college, and I thought it would be ex- exciting to have her join us here on Faith Talks today. So we'll just get right into it. Um, would you just be able to share with us your ministry, first of all, as well as just giving a, a brief background of yourself? Yes. Um, our ministry is called Make a Timothy Today, and the initials, of course, are MTT Ministries. And our goal is to take young people to different countries in the world and the U.S. and Canada and Mexico and take the gospel to those countries by training young people uh, to serve the Lord and then taking them with us to those countries. And we have been doing this for 25 years and have had hundreds of teams that we've taken out so far and have gone to 22 different countries in the world and have seen many, many results of people that have come to know the Lord because of these teams. And I think the thing that sets us off differently than most mission trips is that we do training before we leave. We do a week of training at our home with the team before we even go to the mission field. And we learn all kinds of things. We're not a drama team, but we do dramas. We're not a Bible school team, but we do Bible schools. Um, We do chalk drawings with a message. Uh, We do puppets. We do um, door-to-door visitation. We learn how to do, we teach the young people how to do soul winning and they practice on each other and just multiple things that we do on the trip so that young people can learn a lot of different skills that they can use the rest of their lives. That's really great and I know that several college students that I know have been blessed by joining you all with that. Um, Now just getting into your background, um, would you mind just sharing just how your journey of faith began starting with your salvation testimony and your home as a child and um, just anything you would like to share about your background? Uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, southeastern corner near Lancaster. My husband grew up in Altoona area, and we both grew up on farms near farming country and um, had a very rural life experience. And um, when I was five years old, I accepted Christ as my Savior I knew what it meant to be saved. I had memorized the verses and and knew exactly what it meant to be saved. And so I sat down with my mom. I asked her to show me how I could make sure I was a Christian. And I sat at the Chris, uh, kitchen table with her, and she led me to the Lord, and I prayed and asked the Lord to save me from my sin. When I was 11 at camp, I... Um, Well, before that, I started hearing messages about the unpardonable sin. I had no clue what that meant, but I thought, "Uh uh-oh, maybe I did that. So (laughs) I decided to make sure of my salvation when I was 11. And um, and I was, uh, my parents explained to me uh, the unpardonable sin and that um, I, that's for people that have rejected Christ and not have accepted him. And so I just made sure my salvation at that point. And um, that was how I started out. And I knew at 11 that I was being called into missions. I believe that um, at that time I surrendered to missions and I told the Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do, but please don't send me to Africa. But amazingly enough, years later, we went to Africa. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Um, What trials 
has God grown your faith through and specifically um, the trial with your father and with your family going through um, the health needs? Well, when I was two, we actually lived in Ohio. I don't remember anything of that time, of course, but um, th- it was uh, 1955, and it was right as the polio vaccine had just been um, finished, and it was just starting to be put out there, but um, we didn't have it because it wasn't you know, just ready for public use yet. And so um, right before my second birthday, uh, our family um, was in a situation where my dad was a pastor of a church in Ohio and was, had only been there a year or two, and it was his first church straight out of seminary. And um, there was a polio epidemic in our town and in the surrounding area, and My brother, my oldest brother, I had two brothers. My oldest brother woke up one morning with a sore throat and he couldn't swallow. My mom had tried to feed him breakfast. He was six years old, but he was quite sick and had flu symptoms. And so um, it was bad enough that they took him to the hospital. He had a spinal tap to find out what was going on and they found out that he had polio. And um, a lot of people in the neighborhood were getting it. But um, immediately they put him in the hospital. And then I was the second one to have polio. I woke up one day and I couldn't lift my arm, couldn't move my left arm. And so uh, I also ended up in the hospital. And just... um, A few days later, my dad started having some symptoms, but um, he went to the doctor and they said, oh, you just have sympathetic symptoms. You really don't have anything wrong with you. You need to just go home. You just probably have the flu. Well, he went home and a few mornings later, he could not even get out of bed. And so um, my mom called the deacons of the church. They came, they took him to the hospital and sure enough, he had polio. And from that point on, he never walked again. In fact, he was paralyzed from the neck down, couldn't breathe on his own. So he was in an iron lung and was um, in the hospital for a year. My oldest brother and I were in a convalescent home after we got out of the hospital. And it was more or less to keep you from infecting anyone else, kind of quarantining you and it was um, also to do therapy and that kind of thing and of of course I was only two. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I don't because it was just two. I mean I had just turned two yes so I was very young and my brother was my oldest brother like I said was six and he remembers it all so he's told me all the details and it was quite a rough time because Our parents, um, my mom would come and visit now and then, but um, that was, she was also visiting my dad, which he was in a different hospital. Right. And how long were you in that home? Uh, Six months. Six months. And so separated from your family for six months, that was Mm -hmm. really hard, especially for my brother. And and I didn't know what was going on, but I'm sure I missed my parents (laughs) at that young age. And of course, my dad was in a extremely bad situation and he was in the hospital for a year and so it was rough and my parents loved the Lord they wanted to serve him with their life my dad had been in World War II where where he got saved on the way there and he had surrendered his life to the Lord he said I'll do whatever you want me to do as long as um, you get me out of this war (laughs) and so uh, his whole platoon was killed and he was spared. Wow. That's and amazing. so he said, Okay, I I Lord, I, I am gonna do this. I'll serve you with my life. And at that point he um knew that he would spend the rest rest of his life serving the Lord. And um so uh when he recuperated from polio, he still could not breathe on his own or move anything but his neck and head. 
But he was determined that he was going to serve the Lord anyway, somehow, some way. He couldn't preach anymore because when you're on a respirator, which was what they moved them on to after the, um, being in the iron lung, and um, he could not uh, preach because he couldn't finish a sentence without a breath because his breaths were regulated. So, and my mom had to take care of him day and night. He had to sleep in a rocking bed when we moved my grandparents in Pennsylvania. And that's why I say I grew up in Pennsylvania because we moved there because uh, my dad had to be taken care of totally. And, um, but he, uh, my grandfather was quite inventive and uh, he put, made everything push button in the house so my dad could take a stick in his mouth and push the light switches and that kind of thing. But when he was in the hospital, he decided to take a writing course. And he did um, during that year that he was in the hospital. And uh, he learned how to use a stick in his mouth to type on an electric typewriter. And uh, so when we moved to Pennsylvania, he started a ministry and incorporated it. And uh, he spent the next 26 years, he lived for 26 years after that. This all happened when he was 29. Wow. And so um, for the next 26 years, he lived. And they said, oh, you won't live more than 10 years because most people with polio that is that severe will end up getting pneumonia because they can't cough. All their muscles there, are they don't work. And so um, he really didn't expect to live that long, but God had uh, a purpose for him living that long. And he died when he was 56. So all that time, he typed up a letter once a month for 26 years uh, on the typewriter with a stick in his mouth. And... Um, he was able to reach many people all over the world with the newsletter, and he challenged people not to give up. And um, the way this all affected my my life and the life of my two brothers, my other brother, he did get polio as well, but his was a very light case, so he stayed at home. But all three of us um, really learned by watching our parents, and we all three are serving the Lord because um, we could see it lived out in their lives where they, I never remember hearing them complain about the situation they were in. They um, loved the Lord wholly. My dad spent hours um, in his Bible having devotions every morning and would turn the pages with the stick in his mouth. And I, he just... Um, was an amazing person. My mom was an amazing person. She never complained about having to take care of him day and night. And my dad had to sleep in a rocking bed um, that would move from head to toe. When the head was down, that's when um, the air came out of his lungs. And when it was up and his feet were down, that was when the air came into his lungs. So he lived like that for 26 years. Wow. But um, I don't remember them being upset about it, complaining about it. They were always positive, always upbeat, and just excited about what the Lord was doing in their lives. And I decide, that's why I decided when I was 11. You know, I, I don't know what God has for me, but I know that I will serve him the rest of my life. And that's why I'm doing what we are today in trying to re reach people around the world and to... Um, teach others uh, to serve the Lord also by taking young people with us and trying to help this next generation learn how to serve God and how to love him and serve him with their whole life. Wow, what an unbelievable story. And just hearing of his faith in the Lord during that time, I, can, I can't imagine a trial like that, you know, speaking of uh, big trials, you know, just to go through that and to realize that's the rest of what your life is going to look like, but his response. Um, I was reading the pamphlet, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing just the response that you wrote down that that, that he said after he found out that he had polio. Yes. Uh, in his own words, my dad said um, he decided 
to do this. Uh, God's purpose at first was not clear, he said. I wondered what it all meant. Then one day, a scripture verse came to mind, which I had learned long ago. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And that's in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He said, I resolutely determined then and there to do what these verses enjoined. I began to trust the Lord for the present circumstances and ceased trying to understand the reasons. And he definitely did that. He lived it out in his life. I think so often it's easy to look at a trial that God has placed into our lives and try to reason it out. Why did God do this? And um, I think it's just so amazing to see his response where he gave up trying to figure out why and he decided to do something with his life still. And just that's amazing (laughs) is how he just dedicate his life to writing like that with such a hard time still doing that I can imagine um what a story of faith and I know is is something that um will be encouraging for other people to hear just to see how no matter what we're going through God still can use it for good and um how he used your dad in -hmm. his um state and even just realizing how God loves to use weak vessels and Mm -hmm. all of us feel weakness in so many areas. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure not as weak as he felt, but just how um, when we just surrender those things to the Lord, he can still use them no matter what. Do you mind sharing just how that trial just grew your faith personally? And even if there's been other trials since then that have encouraged you in your walk with the Lord? Sure. Well, um, We have had many trials in our life. Uh, When we take teams out, for one thing, we have trials. Sometimes uh, the money situation, trying to raise the support. And in those early years, we almost lost our home twice. And we thought, you know, God wants us to do this. He'll help supply our needs. And he did every time, amazingly. And then um, in 2005, I found out I had breast cancer, and um, they said I had maybe 10 years to live, and that's been about almost 19 years ago. And I know when I went through cancer, um, my mom also, she died of the same type of cancer, so um, she lived for about 10 years with that after my dad had passed away, and I I just remembered the way my parents reacted to everything that happened in their lives. And I just tried to, um, and it it drew me closer to the Lord. And it helped me to realize, you know, you can do whatever you have to do with God's help. And he can help you through all these trials. I missed going on two teams one at Christmas and one in the spring of that year of our MTT ministry teams with the young people. But other than that, I've been on all the other teams and God um, worked in my life miraculously. And I believe he healed me. I went through lots of treatments and different things, but um, they haven't seen any sign of it since 2006. And so I'm very thankful for what I was taught as a child because I was taught to trust in the Lord. And it's not that I'm trusting in my parents or anybody else, but they were an example to me to trust in the Lord. And so that's what I try to do. And it's not always easy and things aren't easy, but uh, life is that way. But he can show you miracle after miracle and show you how he can help you through every trial in life. Mm -hmm. And it's neat how when you determine to trust him, he always gives you that peace. And no matter what trial you're going through, whether it is some sort of health need that seems like it's going to end fatal, but he gives you that peace in it all and uses it for good, even if you don't understand. I think that's just a theme even from your dad's life and how God used him in so many amazing ways, more than we know, you know, with his writing there and Um, even it's impacting beyond his life to us today and just realizing 
um, just how trials, God works them always together for good, and we can trust him with those things. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to ask if you have any concluding thoughts for our listeners or just points of application that you you really want to share with um, young girls to encourage their faith. Well, just that um, even though, like, like she said, you don't know um, what the future holds. You, d- you just don't. And uh, you don't know what kind of problems you're going to have. But to have a close walk with the Lord, I think, is the most important thing in the world. You need to spend time with him each day. You need to, uh, you need to learn to love him. You need to ask God to help you to have a love for his word and for, for him and what he did for us. And, and just um, to build a love. And if you love the Lord with your whole heart, it's not going to be so easy to fall into sin and it's going to be much easier to make it through trials without giving up. And so I would say just um, take the time to spend with him. I know life gets busy, but um, and don't don't get discouraged and say, well, I haven't had my do- devotions for three days, so what's the use? I just don't have time. But God always wants you to come back to him. He always wants you to come back and trust in his word and to spend time with him. He's never going to turn you away. You need to just um, try to have that close walk and that close um, communication with him every day. And um, I, I did want to mention that this might be an encouragement to you as well. I have a blog that my brothers and I have done that tells the story of my dad in full, in his own words, and um, it might give you a glimpse of um, what I'm saying today about trusting in him, trusting in the Lord, and if you go to www.poliopastor.blogspot.com, you'll see... uh, just several pages in there that we've already posted that you can read his story and how he made it through the war, how he made it through 26 years of dealing with polio and then had cancer at the end and gives a, there's a a devotional paper that he wrote called The Ultimate Test when he went through that last test in his life, when he found out he had colon cancer that had gone to his liver and that he would not be living but a few more weeks after that. And he tells, he writes out eight-page letter there talking about um, how he dealt with facing death. And so that might, some of those things might be an encouragement to you as well. Well, thank you again for just sharing that story. And I would encourage all of our listeners um, to go over and just read more of um, her dad's testimony there and um, just be encouraged by a man who chose to trust when it wasn't easy. And obviously now his faith is being rewarded all of eternity. And that's such a huge blessing to know that. Um, And just thank you for that. And I just encourage each listener, just as you go through your days and whatever trial you may be facing, I know it it may seem negative that we're focused on this, but realizing that actually these trials are not, are not a negative thing, (laughs) but we are going to, um, just as the Bible talks about when we are tried, we're going to come forth as gold and God wants to do that refining work in each one of our lives. And that is the most, the biggest blessing really that we could have from the Lord, that he cares enough to be refining us and to growing, to be growing us in those ways. So I just encourage you just to, to make a decision, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this trial. And maybe you're going through a trial that you don't understand. And I just encourage you just take Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and say, God, I believe this. And um, just trusting in him 
and leaning not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledging him and he will direct your paths so i just encourage you as you go about your days and whatever trial you may be facing um, remember that faith doesn't just talk faith walks thanks for joining us for this episode of the the generation podcast if you've been blessed or helped in any way by this episode or any other episodes Please consider sharing what God has done in your life. Your testimony could be exactly what someone else needs to take their own step out of the boat. To share your testimony, please visit thegeneration.org slash testimony. That's T-H-E-E generation.org slash testimony.